Over the last year, I've been upgrading my home studio by wiring up all my gear and my vocal booth to the patch bays, and then I added a small drum room, a large drum room, an amp room, and wired all those up to the patch bays as well because I wanted to be able to record bands and live stream my recording sessions. I'd made some videos about that journey, which had gotten me to the point where I felt like my studio was perfect and efficient. There's no mixer, and everything runs through the computer interface, which is the center of the system, but after a few band projects, I found myself a bit frustrated by the workflow because I like using my old outboard reverbs. I record certain projects on my reel-to-reel -reel tape machines. And I also do a lot of sessions where there's multiple DAWs and instruments all happening live in the studio. And I want to be able to record all that, monitor it, and live stream it. All of which I was able to do. But it's a real pain in the butt having to do that just using the audio interface and the software mixer. There's always latency issues and these complex routing systems that I needed to do and needed to change all the time. And the fact that all the audio, for the most part, had to go through the computer and there was limited inputs. But I had projects set up, videos I needed to do, and I wanted to get back to working on my own album. I figured maybe I just needed to work on the workflow a little bit more. And then I got this text. Oh man, I was just thinking about how much I missed having a mixer. Was it fate? Providence? Either way, it was too good a deal to pass up. The desk alone was worth way more than the price. But driving down to pick it up, I started freaking out. Do you really need this? Yes. Isn't this just nostalgia for the way you used to record? No. This is new gear rationalization. You need it. You want it. Is it really worth redoing what you spent a year doing? And even as I was loading up the mixer in the desk, I'm thinking to myself, is this gonna be a major waste of time and regret, or is it gonna be so amazing that I'm jumping for joy the first time I use it? But first, I had to get it home and find a place to put it. The desk weighed a ton, but luckily I had Kit and Jake there to help me. The only place I could put it was in my small drum recording room, which also doubles as the Tokyo Teens rehearsal room. I had tested it when I went to pick it up, and I knew that some of the knobs and faders were going to need some cleaning and lubrication. But the next day while testing, I realized that a lot of the knobs had noise on them and were pretty stiff. And as would be expected, the faders were kind of stiff and some of those had noise too. That can be fixed by cleaning and lubricating all the components, but I knew right off the bat it was gonna be a bit more work than I'd hoped. I've never actually opened up and cleaned a mixer before, but I guess there's a first time for everything. This one, the Soundcraft Ghost, opens up from the bottom, which is kind of a pain in the butt, but luckily each one of these cards, which represents each channel, can be removed separately. And the same is true for the faders. I knew this was going to take a lot of time. Even though not all the knobs had noise on them and not all the faders needed super heavy-duty cleaning, I figured if I'm going to open it up, I might as well just clean everything. So we've got 32 individual channels, 8 group channels, and 1 master channel, which means you end up with 41 channels. There are 631 individual knobs. Doing an estimate here, I'm thinking like each individual channel, if I spent 20 minutes on each one between taking it out, cleaning it, and putting it back in. That's a little over 13 hours worth of work. And the faders, which need to be taken out and opened up to really clean them and then put back in, I'm thinking maybe 15 minutes each for those. That's a little over 10 hours. So I'm thinking maybe I'll just do it a little bit at a time as I'm working on other stuff. But I had a lot of people said, oh, we'll come and help. So I thought, oh, let's have like this assembly line party and we'll all get together and we'll just knock out the whole thing in one day, which is great. So in the meantime, I figured, let me go ahead and get started on the easy stuff, like removing the knobs. All of the knobs need to be removed in order to access these nuts, which must also be removed in order to take out the channels for cleaning. And the knobs needed some cleaning too. The fader knobs needed to be removed as well. At this point, it was just a matter of getting everybody over here at the same time to help me. I would left the board set up in the other room where I dabbled with it a little bit and I had the desk set up there and, as well, but it was taking a lot of time, weeks. I needed to get this done. I had rehearsals coming up with the Tokyo Teens because we had a gig coming up. I had sessions I needed to do. I just, I just needed to get this done. So I just decided I'm just gonna start it and do it myself till it's done. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna do it. Just do it! Until it's done. First, take off the ribbon connectors. 
Remove the fader from each channel and set aside. Repeat. 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 Next, remove the circuit board for each channel. Disconnect from the input circuit board and set aside. Repeat. 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 I started to add up the number of different components in the mixer, but that alone was taking some time. Let's just say, there's a lot of them. And there's a lot of dust and other things in there as well. Next, I needed to clean each one of the 631 potentiometers by spraying cleaner into the little hole on the housing and twisting the shaft back and forth several times. The problem I was having is that the cleaner I chose sprays out of that nozzle at a high pressure, and even if I have it positioned right over the hole, some of it would ricochet back into my face, get on the other components, and smell up the room with all its nasty chemicals. Plus, I'd accidentally ordered a small can and I ran out pretty quickly. So I decided to try a homemade formula that my friend Paul Diaz, the owner of Tree Sound, and the guy who sold me this mixer, told me about using this and this. Let's check it out. So here's how it works. You get your Marvel's Mystery Oil. And I'm only gonna do a small amount just to demonstrate it because I don't really have that much to clean today. But you put one part Marvel's, dump that in there, and then three parts, 99% alcohol. So we're gonna go one, two, three. Then you mix it up. Then you take a syringe and you get it all in there. And there you go. Now the way this works is the alcohol cleans it and then it's gonna evaporate, but it leaves a small bit of that oil on there for lubrication. And I know it sounds kind of crazy using this stuff, but I've talked to a couple old school engineer guys who swear by this, so this is what I'm gonna try. It took a little getting used to, the whole trick being to just barely squeeze the syringe. And what would happen is the formula would seep into the potentiometer and loosen them up quicker and leave them smoother turning than the spray did. Next, I moved on to cleaning the faders. Some people would just spray cleaner into this gap right here and slide the fader up and down, but me, being me, I decided to take them apart and give them a thorough cleaning. Plus, I've never taken a fader apart before, much less even held one in my hand. What I'm doing here is cleaning the two sets of contacts, which control the signal volume. First are these long ones that run the length of the circuit board. As you can see, they needed a little cleaning. Next are these teeny little contacts which sit on the sliding part of the fader. At one end of the long contacts, the voltage is low, and at the other end, the voltage is high, which changes the volume as the sliding contacts move back and forth. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer, and I'm not sure if I'm even explaining that exactly right, so if you want to rip me for explaining it wrong or correct me, just put it in the comments. Either way, these contacts need to be cleaned. Now this might have been where the spray would have been better, but I didn't have any, so I just barely touched these things and they came out all right. And I've heard a lot of people say that just spraying a cleaner into components can wash away lubricants that you don't want to wash away. So when I opened this up and saw this, the lubrication for the slider, I was glad that I used the homemade solution. So I put it all back together and moved on to the other 39 faders that still needed cleaning. One of the things I had not counted on were these nuts. It took long enough taking off all 631 of these things, but putting them back on was not something I'd really planned. It took forever. 
At this point in time, I was literally in a race. I had to get the mixer and the desk out of this room for rehearsals we were having in a couple days, which meant going ahead and putting them in the control room, but I had somebody coming in to record drums in four days. I'm just slamming to get this done. Now, I was thinking since all my gear was already wired up to the patch bays, it was just a matter of getting them out of the old racks, taking down the old desk, taking down the speakers, getting everything out of the way, and moving the mixer and new desk in there. I figured three days with a fourth day for cleanup before my drum session. I'm actually, I'm but gotta, first, I'll probably end the stream soon. Because there was something I had right to now. do. Yeah, after the stream today, everything you see here, five minutes my regular after Wednesday the afternoon stream, live all stream of this here is going to get pulled out, and then my ghost mixer, which is sitting in the other room in this massive Argosy desk, is going to replace this here. So for the next three days, I'm not going to be able to work. So y'all have a good day. Thanks for watching. See you later. And boom, we started taking everything apart. My original plan had been to use my existing mixer stand because the stands for the new desk were huge. They're kind of tall and I thought would take up too much space. But at the end of the day, after putting the desk and the mixer and some gear on top of it, it just didn't look strong enough. So first thing the next morning, I got up and cut those wooden stands down, replaced the old stand and got back to work setting up the gear. But at some point I forgot to keep filming and I didn't realize that till about three o'clock in the morning when I tried to film an update. I'm at the end of Tay Do. I'm at I'm at the end of I'm at the end of day. T so I'm at the end of day two, and I've got um I got the end of day two. End of day two. We changed the base and moved everything, and I'm gonna fuck thing. Whatever. I'll do this tomorrow. The armrest on the desk had a huge rip in it, plus I felt like it was about three inches too high, so I decided, let me take it down and reupholster it. Now, I've never actually reupholstered anything before, but like I said, there's a first time for everything. I wasn't able to mount it by myself, so I put it off till I could get some help. Well, it's the end of day three. I gave myself three days to do this. Obviously, I'm, I'm not done. And I actually, there's a lot of stuff I didn't film because I realized I was running out of time. I've got somebody showing up tomorrow night to load in drums to do some drum sessions. So at a certain point, I was like, why wow, I can't film everything. So I'll show you what I have done and what I'm doing now. I've got all this gear here patched up to the patch bay. I've got all my distressors, all my vocal stuff over here, the lunchbox, all this is now wired up to the patch bay. I had to change a couple things because I changed the where it was in the control room, so I had to lengthen the cable on some of them. I've now got this stuff over here. Got this other lunchbox here. I still got to wire this up, but that's no big deal. Move this stuff over here. I'm just about to put in 16 line inputs into the patch bay using this old Neve patch bay here. I've been cleaning this up. Couple microphone inputs to put into the board. I'm about to put those into the patch bay. And, um, oh yeah, I've got to get the armrest installed back in before tomorrow night. Somehow I've got to figure out how to get the armrest in there. Uh, all right, I'm going to put this patch bay into the rack and then I'm I'm going to bed. Well, it's day four and I still don't have everything hooked up because I ended up having to redo half of the wiring between my gear and the patch bays because the whole rig is slightly wider than the old one and I decided to move some of the gear. So some of these cables ended up being too short by inches. So my goal was to get all my existing mic pre's hooked up so I can get this drum session done and get the mixer hooked up so I can at least use one channel on it. I'll deal with the armrest after the session. And then the artist I was working with, Sleepyhead, showed up hours early to load in his drums for the next day's session. But luckily he insisted on helping me and he knew what the hell he was doing. We managed to get the armrest installed, all my mic pre's connected, my streaming and filming rig working, cleaned up the studio and had time to listen to some music and plan for the next day's session. And it was great. The drums sounded awesome and there were no technical issues. But since I'd only hooked up one mic channel to the mixer so I could say I used it, I wasn't able to say, was it worth it or not? Well, the only way I was going to find out was by finishing up the wiring, which was going to take a few more days. And I, I didn't film any of that because, frankly, I 
I was sick of it and I had over 100 gigabytes of footage already. The only thing I filmed was me doing the trim work where I'd lowered the armrest. But finally I got it all done and it was time to try it out. But it was also time for a live stream and I figured, what the heck, let's just test it live during a live stream. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to the live stream. This live stream is about an hour and a half long, so I'm only gonna show some of the highlights. If you wanna watch the whole thing, it's on my YouTube channel. I'll leave a link in the description below. Today, I'm gonna be integrating in this mixer. I don't actually mix on this thing. It's mainly for sessions. However, while I'm mixing, I do use it to patch in some of my outboard gear. First off, let me explain how I'm doing this. So right here in Ableton, you'll see that I made an insert return here. And instead of having a reverb on there, I'm sending it to an external output. And so in this case, I've got to go to the Rev7. It's going out of my Apogee, which is nine. And then if I wanna to go to the Wedge, I can go to 11. So that goes out. And here, let's go over to the patch bay. These are my outputs coming from the DAW. Then they go to over here. So here are my inputs for the Rev7 and the Wedge. And then their outputs come here and they're going over to this funky patch bay right over here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it back there. It's an old Neve patch bay and I still got to get it more permanently located. The reason it's sitting up this way is because it's way bigger than your normal patch bays. This thing's probably 30 or 40 years old, but it's built like a tank. So I've got everything patched into that. That is going into the board, right? And then on the board, they come in right here. So here's my Rev7 and my Wedge. And then those get sent to these group outputs, which are balanced, plus four. And then those I patch back into my DAW. I'm going to go ahead and just work on this track. And uh, we'll see where this whole crazy thing goes. Ooh. That's kind of cool. It's not what I was really thinking I was going to use, but I like that. That's the hall reverb. Nah. That's like a room sound into a flange. Man, I'm going back to that. I'll tell you what, I like that. What was it? It was, uh, oh shoot, I passed it. Oh, here. It's a little long here. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to shorten the decay time. So it's like five second decay. That's way too long. I like that. So now what I do is I can actually print that reverb. Oh, I like that. So I want that to be going to my Rev7, which is coming in here on the board. Ooh, that sounds like some 80s stuff. I like that. I've used this as, this is the gate reverb. I'm gonna try out some other settings here. That's like a reverse gate. There's one, uh, oh yeah, it's this live reference. It's like a room sound, and I usually bring the liveness up. I like that. It's either that or the gate. Yeah, I like that gate, man, I'll tell you what. but I do wanna um, EQ it a little bit. So let's go back to the mixer here. So here's my Rev7 here. I'm gonna turn on my EQ for the reverb return. I'm just gonna dial back the high end a little bit. Woo! I like that. I might put it on these toms too, so if I bring that on the tom, so that'd be like. I 
like having an actual mixer with all the capabilities on here. Like you got the mix A here, which is all these faders. You got the mix B, which is basically this volume and this pan knob here. But here you've got all these auxiliary sends. You've got six mono auxiliary sends and then two stereos. That means you can send that out to a million different places and bring them in a bunch of ways. And of course you got the EQ and every channel can be three different things. You can hit a button and it's line input. So you know, like I'm bringing in my effects and stuff right here or keyboards or whatever. You hit another button up at the top, it switches this to a mic input. This can become a mic pre with EQ. Hit another button and it's a tape return. So you can have three different sources hooked up to each channel and change what the channel's used for depending on where that switch is set. The capability when I'm doing sessions is that it just allows me to do so many things that I've not been able to figure out how to do it in a DAW using like their, like their little console app or something like that. That's kind of why I ended up putting the board in and doing all this. Speaking of which, I am going to... Now I'm going to go ahead and record that reverb in. I think it's safe to say that at this point, I didn't regret doing this. Was it a waste of time? Nah, but it definitely took a lot of time and it got me behind on everything that I've been working on. I do think you can say, I look kind of happy. Now, did I jump for joy? No, but Woo! I did yell and yeah! I yelled again. Yeah. This whole experience was a bigger deal than I thought it was going to be. It was way more than just about the board. I ended up doing a lot of improvements to the studio and it got me really thinking deeply about my home studio. What is it to have a successful home studio? And I think it's about having it being efficient, that you can get in here and work and not have to think about the technical aspects. I just want to be creative. I don't want to have my brain taken up with patching things and all that. I just, I just want to get down here and work. The other thing is, what is the center of my studio? I never really thought about it that way and I think I finally found the answer. It's, it's about having a mixer for me. Having a mixer, that's gotta be the center of the studio. And now I have that and I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really happy where my studio's at. So thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe, watch my Wednesday afternoon live streams and y'all have a good day. See you later.